This is Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500. Danica Patrick continues to impress. During final practice for Sunday's Indy 500, Danica posted the fastest speed in the field at more than 225 miles per hour. Except for one wiggle in qualifying, it may have cost her the pole. She has been nearly perfect throughout the month of May. Well, the count gallant continues toward the greatest spectacle in racing. Welcome to Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500. Along with Scott Goodyear, I'm Jerry Punch. Glad to have you with us. Now, during the next half hour, we'll hear from all of your favorite drivers. The entire field, all 33, will share their thoughts here on Sunday's big race. But first, Scott, let's get your thoughts on Carburation Day. Danica Patrick, fastest on the track on Carb Day. Does that also mean she'll be fastest on the track on race day? Well, Doc, she's got fast simply because she's been listening to the team with the leadership of Bobby Rahal and Scott Remke and all their engineering staff. As long as she continues to do that sort of thing, that's what's going to make her fast on race day. Well, she found the speed certainly on carburation day. There's a look at the top speeds on carb day in practice in the afternoon. Patrick and Kanan, Weldon, Hornish Jr., and Thomas Schechter. Surprising all month long. The sensational rookie climbed out of the car and we asked her, what about the expectations and pressure? I don't think there's any pressure. I mean, everybody, you know, everybody internally, for sure, within the team and the series, they, they know the deal, and I'm a rookie, and, they, and there's a lot of stuff that I have yet to learn. But I think that, you know, there's a lot of expectation. You know, I hear people say to me, we're, we're, we're you know, expecting you to win. I'm like, well, what if I finish second or third or fourth, you know? Like, oh, you're going to do it. You know, it's okay, I'll, try, I'll do everything I can to win. Trust me, I want to win more than anybody wants me to win. Um, but we'll have to just wait for that day to come, and, and uh, if everything is supposed to happen that way, it will. Well, Danica's been perfect all month, except that little wiggle in qualifying on the first lap, you know. But why is race day so much different than what's happened up until now? Well, certainly 500 miles is completely different than trying to go out and do four for qualifying. You think about all those miles you have to race with everybody else on the racetrack trying to get past you. And the other key thing also is that, you know something, there's going to be eight or ten pit stops here. A lot of opportunity to make error, not only from the team, but also from the driver, especially when you are a rookie. I look at it right now that she can get to the end of the race and get ready to go racing for those last 20 miles. That's going to be the key thing for her. Like I said, great leadership with the team. We'll have to see if she can get it done inside the cockpit. But I admire her composure and her poise. She's been unbelievably poised and composed. In fact, she's been under the microscope all month long. All those interviews, 60 interviews in 36 hours all over the planet. New York, the late show with her co-owner, with her co -owner, you know, David Letterman. I mean, what a poised woman, uh, what a poised race driver she is. I think she will be able to handle it very, very well. Now, former Indy 500 champion Buddy Lazier crashed in warm-ups during car day competition. In the early laps, Buddy Lazier had his problems on the racetrack. Right now you see him coming out of turn four, and the key thing with Buddy is that he is a veteran here. He won here in 1996, so I'm not sure that he's going to be rattled by this. I think that he's going to be able to withstand that. The Panther team has done a great job. They will put the car back together for him, probably just as he had it on qualifying day. I look for him to be a contender on race day simply from the fact that he has a veteran. We um, are going to fix the car that we have, and if there's any kind of problem there, we have an, a very good race car as, an, as a backup option. But uh, right now, that car is going to race. Basically, I was entering ten, turn four, just warming up, and there was a snap that came through the steering wheel, and I lost the entire steering control, and it just, you know, just took off on me. So there was no way to save the car. He heard a snap, and suddenly he had no steering at 200 and some miles an hour. How does that affect his mindset for race day? Well, like I said, he is a veteran, so I'm not so sure that's going to bother him so much. But, you know, the team that he's using actually is a bit of a part-time team because they have two full-time cars. He's just running here at Indianapolis, so that's going to play on him just a little bit. He'll want to get in the car, take the green flag, and get into a rhythm, and then that whole thing from carburetion day will probably go away from him. We're talking about the fact that he could become a factor here on race day. Everyone's saying he's the fastest Chevrolet in the field. He'll resume his spot outside of row three at ninth starting position. And because he is so composed during the race, a lot of folks, even Roger Penske said, I wouldn't be surprised to see Buddy Lazier be a factor. I've picked him as my dark horse. You know, and the key thing is that, like I said, he's the third team for the month of May, but he's actually the fastest Chevy, as you mentioned, Doc. That's really impressive. And it's not lost on the other two drivers that are actually in that team right now. I think that whole Panther group right now is sort of rallying around Buddy because he has the experience here. Well, we've already heard from Danica Patrick and Buddy Lazier in the show. As we go to break, we continue to hear from all 33 drivers in the field. Here's Thomas Schechter's thoughts on making his fourth Indy 500 start. It's my fourth year here and uh, you know I've learned a lot. I've, I've led a lot of laps and uh, you know I, I think I can uh, figure it out a little bit better than I did before. I feel good. You know I mean you always get a little more amped up I think for the Indy 500 with the expectations, the crowds, 
what they make of the race. But once it comes down to the actual race, I'm, I'm more confident than I've ever been. I'm looking forward to getting the race underway now. I think we've, we've, we've done all the work we can. If we haven't got it right by now, it's, uh, it's never going to be right. I'm feeling pretty good, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it's been a long month and a uh, lot's happening. And uh, I'm just hearing so much about what it's like on race day, coming out through Gasoline Alley, seeing all the crowds. And uh, I'm just looking forward to experiencing it for myself. Expectations are, are high. I want to get a surprise because last year was the surprise of the other way because we were so dominant through the month that I was surprised how, how bad we were on the race. I feel we have a, a strong chance of winning the race, but you know some things have to fall our way. Probably in a long time I haven't felt that way, but I think legitimately we can be in the top 10 and try to get there maybe with about 50 laps to go and then let's see what happens. 500 miles, the most important thing is take care of your car and constantly uh, just position yourself in a good place. Uh, head into the last pit stop. First of all, I want to finish the race and uh, I want to finish uh, better than last year, so it means a top 10 finish. We're a bit of the underdogs, me being a rookie and everything. I mean, if we won this, I mean, that'd, that'd be a, a great story and it'd be an aw awesome accomplishment. Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500 is brought to you by Heineken. It's all about the beer. Heineken. On the 29th annual Checkers Rallies Pit Stop Challenge, part of Carburation Day, and the final saw Brian Herta against Sam Hornish Jr. Now remember, it is total elapsed time here in the box. Not who's in first and who is out. Brian Hurd of the XM Satellite Crew gets in first for Andretti Green. Good pit stop for Hurd at 9.917 seconds. Finally, Hornish gets the car started, heads down pit road, and what a job this Penske team did. Matt Johnson and company getting Hornish out in 8.970 seconds, and Marlboro Team Penske becomes the world champion. Roger Penske winning his eighth world championship in the pit stop competition. Well, you've already heard from 11 different drivers in the show. Now, before we're done, we promise you'll hear from the entire field. Now, if you haven't heard from your driver as of yet, stick around. He may just be next. I'm trying to stay calm. I think uh, it's just another race. Obviously, everybody makes a big deal out of Indianapolis, and it is a big deal. But uh, to me, it's, it's another race that I have to race as hard as I did the other ones. And uh, if we have a good day, we're going to look very good. Just go out there, you know, to, uh, try to keep up with Tony and uh, make it to the end of the race. I think that the race is going to be won in between the last pit stop and the, uh, and the end of the race because, uh, you know, everybody is so competitive this year. I'm ready, ready to rock and roll. I know this, this race is um, it's about uh, patient strategy and uh, be in the right place on the right time. And I guess I have the right team. Really looking forward to the start of the race. I think it's, uh, it's an exciting moment in a career, the first Indy 500. And uh, I've been doing uh, many classics so far, but uh, not this one. And, uh, you know, really looking forward to it. You got to make sure that uh, you're there at the end. That's, that's the biggest uh, deal in this whole thing. And then hopefully you have what it takes in the end. If you're fast enough, then you probably have a good shot. And if, if you're not, then you won't win it. We definitely want to be on the offensive side. We don't want to be on defense and uh, you know that's the the 500 now is going to be a sprint race and you're going to have to go fast as soon as they throw the green flag. Indy is uh, such a great race and uh, it is different and special from all the other ones we do so you know I just uh, you know hoping that my car is good in the race uh, obviously we don't practice for a week so you always kind of wonder about that and the track changing but I feel great. This has been the most mentally tiring month I've ever had in my life. Um, you know, some days I've had uh, a very quick car and then that same car's not been very quick the next day and we haven't been able to put our finger on exactly why. Um, so I, I would say my emotions are mixed but very determined right now. Well, Scott points leader Dan Weldon talks about how emotionally draining this month has been, and he's typically very happy-go-lucky, but he won three of the first four events here in 2005 but had trouble finding speed early in the month of May. How much of a factor will he be, and how strong will he be on race day? Well, they arrived here, and they were very, very quick when they unloaded off the trailer, and then they lost speed all the way up to the pole day. And they know last week they seemed like they started to find a little bit more speed, not running too bad on carburation day, but you know something? I think he's a smart driver, much smarter than he was a couple of years ago, remember, when he ran 
then Sam Hornish down into the grass and ended up going onto its roof. And I think the key thing right now, he just needs to get out there and make sure he's there at the end of the day. And I think he's a smart enough driver today to be able to do that. Talk about the pressure here for the month of May. He's typically very happy-go-lucky, very accommodating, very likable guy. He's just been really tough to deal with all, all month long with his crew. How does that happen? You know, you picked up something that I saw a couple of days ago simply because Tony Kanan is having a lot of fun. He's a jokester that he always is. And usually Dan is right there with him. But you know something? Dan, like you said, seems to be sort of underneath the radar screen right now. And I think there's a lot bothering him. But you know something? I still expect for him to come out on race day and be determined, as he said he was going to be. So do I. And as we go to break, we continue to hear from all 33 drivers in the field. Here is Thomas Inga, who starts on the inside of row four. It's a great race, so I think um, I'm still thinking like for me it's a normal race, so I want to succeed as much as possible. Last two years I was 10th, and I'm certainly hoping for a lot better finish than that this year. So uh, I'm really excited. It's you know this is the race everybody wants to win, and obviously that's my goal and dream to win this race. I'm pretty excited. I've uh, it's it's usually a pretty long month, and uh, you get kind of anxious to have the race uh, underway, and and. That's what I'm looking forward to. Well, the Menards Infinity Pro Series portion of Carb Day was the Futaba Freedom 100. And rookie pole sitter Jaime Camaro claimed his first pole, looking for his first win. The race goes green, but on lap two, there's trouble with Cole Carter slams the wall hard in turn three. Lap 15, John Herb, the Phoenix winner. He passes Kamara for the lead. Herb, who had won at Phoenix a few laps later. Kamara goes back by Herb to take over the position. Restart, lap 37, as you watch this pass. On board with Marco Andretti as Herman Quaroga spins out. Andretti able to avoid the spinning car. That sets up the final yellow and the sprint to the finish as Jaime Camara holds off New Zealander Wade Cunningham for the victory, the third year in a row that the pole center has won here and the Futaba Freedom 100. Take a look at the finish here. Jaime Camara, Wade Cunningham, Jay Drake, Al Unser, the third generation driver finishing fourth. There's a look at the top eight here after 100 miles at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, AJ Fourth the Fourth came up through the Infinity Pro Series, claiming the series' very first championship back in 2002. Sunday, AJ starts from row 10, making his third career Indy 500 start. I'm calm right now, but uh, of course we'll have the butterflies early in the morning Sunday. But uh, once you get in the car and you get strapped in, you get those few pace laps out of the way, and then we'll be ready to go. We definitely do not have the fastest car out there, but seldom does the fastest car win. Uh, I do believe we have a very consistent car. I have a car that I feel. We can go high, we can go low, we can just go out anywhere, and, and uh, it's definitely ready for a dogfight. Just not to uh, make any stupid moves um, in the pits and on the track, because um, it doesn't mean anything to, to try to make a pass but halfway through the race. It doesn't mean you know, you're going to win the race, you're only going to lose it. So I just uh, minimize my uh, mistakes. I'm really happy to be here again, and, uh, and you never know what's going to happen. So hopefully uh, we're going to get to the end, and and see what happens. We're working very hard and we gained quite a bit of speed this week so uh, we think we have a good car for the race so I'm looking forward to it especially to see those grandstand packed with people and stuff I think it's going to be amazing. Winning the race would be something that we're not you know can't really look at right now we just don't have the speed but uh, hopefully run all day and that, that's the biggest goal and if you can survive this race and be there at the end you usually have a good day. There's a lot going on that you could get really stressed out about and uh, you know you've got, you've got a lot of your time taken up so you could quite easily get stressed out and uh, you know, agitated by it all, but I just, I just try and chill out and have fun with it. A little nervous, I think, just, uh, you know, to see what, what comes out of it. Um, it's, it's always hard going into this race if you spend enough time on setup and things like that, so you're always a little nervous that you have a good car. Well, it has been a tough month for the Target Chip Ganassi race team. They've struggled to find speed, and, and for a team that's won this race before, you know, will they have a shot on race day? Well, you know, I think the key thing for them right now is they are a very good team simply because they've won here before in 2000 with Juan Montoya. But the key thing with Manning having that crash and all those things that have gone on so far, as you watch Manning crashing coming out of turn two here back on May 13th, the key thing is to get the opportunity to get in the race and pace yourself and get the car ready for the end of the day. And that's what all the drivers do that have won here, especially Rick Mears, who's won here four times before. Even though he didn't have the fastest car at the very beginning of the day, he made the car faster throughout the day. The team is very good. The driver Drivers are very good. Suspect on the engine. Maybe Toyota doesn't have enough power, but the key thing right now, it's all about fuel mileage and placement for the end of the day. And strategy on race day. Well, we've already heard from 30 drivers in the show. As we go to break, we fill out our field of 33, starting with Ed Carpenter, who starts in row number nine. 
I'm really looking forward to it. I feel really good about my car. I would have been uh, liked to have been a little quicker through qualifying, but really happy with the car. The team's doing a good job, and I'm a lot more relaxed coming into my second 500 than I was last year, so I think that's going to make me better too. I think Inge is a special race, but I always take it as a regular race to get a little bit entrance and we don't want to do well, but not much emotions. That's pretty much what I feel. Just excited to be back. Uh, you know, last year I had to watch it on TV and to know that, uh, you know, my name is going to be on the wall out there. Just really excited to be back. Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500 is brought to you by Nissan, who invite you to shift your ride. Well, guys, here we are for the last Tony stake, and uh, it's getting close to race day, so uh, the emotions are starting to kick in. Uh, a little bit of butterfly in the stomach, but um, I'm, I feel pretty confident in uh, a little rituals that I have. People that know me for years know that uh, I wear a, a lucky underwear on Sunday, so uh, I'll have that safe in the bus clean, and uh, I'll do all my stuff. Put my left shoe first, get it in uh, from the left side of the car, and... Uh, I will invite you guys to drink a fat-free milk Sunday afternoon. Hopefully, TK will uh, celebrate with you guys the victory. And uh, I just wish you guys the best and uh, all the best. And uh, we'll be back. And thank you very much, TK. Tony Kanon, Reading Series champion and pole sitter here for taking time all month long to be a part of our Tony's Take here on Sports Hitter. Well, time now, Scott, to play contender, pretender. And here's how it works. I'll throw out a name, and you tell me if he or she is a contender or pretender to win the Indy 500. Before we start, I want you to give us your criteria for how you're going to make your selections. Well, Doc, I was looking at three things when I was thinking about this. Number one, the driver who's obviously got to drive the car on race day. The team that has to support them, obviously, during the pit stops, and also the equipment they're using. So the first person we're going to look at, let's look at Danica Patrick. You know, she has all the winning package from last year because they won here with the Ray Hall Letterman team before the Panos chassis, the Honda power plant, and she can certainly drive the car here. But 500 miles of racing at 225 miles an hour, there's a lot of opportunity for error. I'm going to have to put her down as a pretender. Her teammate, Victor Mira. Well, a contender. He has all the same package as Danica, a great team, was one of the fastest here last year during the race, and he ran as high as third. He's quiet, he's fast, and during his third start, I think he'll get the job done. Sam Hornish Jr. A contender. His luck here at Indianapolis has to change. You know, two-time series champion. He gets 110% out of his car, and I think he'll keep the leader in sight, and then he'll pounce right at the very end. Elio Castro Nevins. Well, I'm going to mark him down as a pretender, and you might ask why if Sam's teammate is actually a contender, but, you know, a two-time winner here in a pole sitter before, I just think that he's going to sit back and maybe look at things a little bit differently than Sam. Sam's a little bit more eager because he hasn't won this race. Scott Sharp. A contender. You know, a veteran here with his 11th start. He's with that new team with Delphi Fernandez. He has a new chassis with a Panos, the Honda engine, which is the thing to have, and you know something? He's very eager and very confident. Rookie Sebastian Bourdais. Mark him down as a pretender. He's, like you said, a rookie from Le Mans, France. He's got a road course background, has won on a couple of short ovals, but he admits, you know something, I'm learning a lot here at this very fast track, especially high-speed drafting. Adrian Fernandez. A contender. You know, very fast here last year, very patient driver who knows how to get himself right to the end of the race because he knows how to pace himself. He won three of six races at the very end of last season and at the age of 41, still fast. Points leader, Danny Weldon. Well, I think right now, Danny, because he's won three of the four first races, he has the right team, the right equipment, and you know, I think he's really matured over the last couple of seasons, and I think right now, we're looking at a guy that's struggled, but is fast. The comeback kid, Kenny Breck. Well, Kenny's taking over for the injured Buddy Rice, and I think that he surprised a lot of people what he has done. And remember that race in 2003 at Texas where he almost got killed? He's got the speed, he's got the team, but I'm not sure he's got the endurance. And the man on the pole, Tony Kanaan. Well, he's known as Superman, you know, in last year's IRL's points championship leader. I think right now he's got the team, the equipment, and we don't call him Superman for nothing, and I think that he's going to be a factor all day long. I look for him to take off from the start, lead a lot of laps. He wants to give Michael Andretti his first Indianapolis 500 victory. Well, Scott, we've heard from all 33 drivers. We've broken down the field. Now it's time to get your prediction. Who do you think is going to win the 89th running of the Indianapolis 500? Well, I'll say number 26, Danny Weldon. I know he's had his struggles this month. He hears that he's down, but you know something? I think this guy has 
learned a lot, like I mentioned, from a couple of years ago when he ended up on his roof and turns three and four. You know, he's matured a lot and he's patient, he's smart, he's learned a lot from his teammates, and I think he's going to turn around and surprise everybody. So many compelling stories. The comeback of Kenny Breck. I mean, what Danica Patrick might be able to do. If Danica Patrick can win this race, it will be a landmark day in oval track racing, a landmark day at this event. They say Indianapolis can alter your life forever if you win this race. If Danica Patrick wins the Indy 500, it could change the Indy 500 and IRL IndyCar Series racing forever. for many, many years to come. Well, it's been a great month of May here in Indianapolis. Tonight, we wrap up our weekday coverage. Make sure you join us throughout the weekend on SportsCenter and ESPN News for continuing coverage of the greatest spectacle in racing. We leave you tonight with our SportsCenter Top 10 Indy 500 finishes. And we say so long, everyone, from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Number 10, in 1911, Ray Haroon secured his place in Indy history by winning the inaugural Indianapolis 500. The significance of Haroon's victory was that his bright yellow car, the Marmon Wasp, was the only single seat car in the race. Number 9, last year in a rain shortened Indy 500, the race came down to the final hour. With drivers taking chances with more rain pending, pole sitter Buddy Rice became the first American born winner at Indy since 1998 giving Indianapolis native David Letterman his first Brickyard victory as a car owner. Number eight, in 1999, with just over one lap to go, Robbie Gordon saw his first Indy 500 victory was well within reach. Unfortunately for Gordon, what he did not see was his gas tank approaching empty. With Gordon forced to pit for a refuel, native Swede Kenny Brack takes the checkered flag in only his third Indy start. At number seven, for the first time in Indy history, the 500 lasted two days due to rain. In 1967, A.J. Foyt won his third Indianapolis 500 as he navigated his Ford at 50 miles per hour through a five-car crash on the front straightaway. And there's an accident on the front straightaway! Ray Foyt, I don't know whether he can get through or not. There he is! A.J. Foyt will win the Indianapolis 500. We go way back to 1912 for number six when Joe Dawson took the checkered flag because of a lucky break. On lap 199, race leader Ralph De Palma's Mercedes broke down, and De Palma was forced to push his car across the finish line, placing 11. Number 5, 1991, Michael Andretti was seeking his first Indy victory in his eighth start. The problem for Andretti was he engaged in a heated duel with three-time winner Rick Mears and came out on the short end as Mears took the checkered flag 3.1 seconds ahead of Andretti. Number 4, 2005, marks the 20th anniversary of Danny Sullivan's spin-and-win victory of 1985. As Sullivan passed Mario Andretti on lap 120, his number five car performed a 200 mile an hour pirouette, just missing the wall on the south short shoot. Sullivan would regain the lead 20 laps later by passing Andretti again and go on for the victory. Number three, the 1989 Indianapolis 500 will be remembered for one thing, turn three of lap 199. Emerson Fittipaldi touched tires with Al Unser Jr., sending Unser Jr. into the wall. Fittipaldi narrowly escaped the wreck and went on to win the record purse of just over $1 million. Number two, through 199 laps of the 1982 Indianapolis 500, Gordon Johncock and Rick Mears were in a dead heat. Johncock took the outside line on the final lap, and a close finish between the two was inevitable. Johncock off the fourth turn. Mears is right behind him. Johncock, Mears makes a try. Johncock wins it. I lost the one-tenth of a second. And at number one, a decade later in the 1992 500, Al Unser Jr. and Scott Goodyear provided the most dramatic finish in Indianapolis history. The checkered flag is out. Goodyear makes a move.